learning in these first four tutorials basically is how the thing works from the inside and now we're going to sort of learn some shortcuts of various kinds. Um, the first shortcuts, first rules of new rules of inference that we're going to get are again uh, pretty obvious but maybe not as a, actually a, yeah. Um, I, had a, I had a question if there was a rule that um, if you have um, if you have any letter that you know is true, like if you're giving a, giving a premise Q or something like that, can you just take any arbitrary letter and say P implies Q because it can't be false? Well, it actually, I, we won't have a rule like that, but you'll, have, you'll actually prove that. I think we'll prove that this morning even. Because I was trying to use that, and I didn't know what the rule was, so I wanted to do it. Uh, there's, there's no rule like that to, that I'm aware of, but the fact is, as, as you say, if you know that something's true, then just by the curiosities of material implication, then everything implies it. Everything. <laughs> Contradictions imply it, if it's true. Uh, so we're not going to admit that as a rule, but it's a good thing to sort of help feed logical intuitions is to know that. So if you see something like that in a problem, whether it's in the logic cafe or on a quiz or whatever, if you see something like that, then at least that'll sort of render, you know, give you, offer you some confidence that, well, look, uh, this could be pretty easily proved. In fact, it, it doesn't take long to, to demonstrate that. Okay. Let's go first over modus tollens. Uh, you, we already had a rule called horseshoe um, elimination, horseshoe E, which allowed us to go from P horseshoe Q along with P to Q. Classically, not in the logic cafe, but traditionally that's got a Latin name too. This is a Latin name. I don't know what it means. It means modus tollens. <laughs> it means you can do this. <laughs> But uh, modus ponens is the, is the normal name that's offered in logic, t logic textbooks for P horseshoe Q along with P legitimizes Q, what we called horseshoe elimination. So if you ever come across the words modus ponens somewhere, and it'd be hard to imagine that you'd find them in any kind of normal contexts, unless you're reading philosophy texts or something like that. But if you find the word modus tollens, it's just the other side of this one. There's modus ponens and modus tollens. And this one says that, if, uh, once again, you need two premises for this to work. But if you have those two, if you have any, anything of the form P horseshoe Q, and if you also have not Q, you can conclude not P. Why? Once again, it's because material implication would say that the horseshoe is false any time you'd have not Q and P. So if the horseshoe is true, then you can't have that combination. You can't have true premises and false conclusion. In other words, you couldn't have the combination not Q and P. So given P horseshoe Q and given not Q, you know that not P. Any questions about that? The thing about rules of inference is they are rules that show you that a, a particular conclusion may be validly drawn from sets of premises, in this case a pair of premises, sometimes from one premise, sometimes from, from, from more than one. But that you can legitimately draw that conclusion if you have premises of that form. Whereas rules of replace, see they, they work on the whole lines, I mean you have to have these entire lines. You can't operate within uh, parentheses or brackets, for example. I mean, you have to use the whole line. Like you have to, you know, no matter how long the line is, it has to have uh, the horseshoe as its main connective. The other one has to have negation of the main connective and has to be negating the consequent of that first horseshoe. 
Whereas rules of emplacement, replacement can, may be used within brackets. I mean, if you see A and B anywhere inside of a, for, of a, of a lengthy uh, molecular sentence, you can flop, around, flop that around to B and A. So that's one of the things that's uh, legitimized. And you can also go both ways with a rule of replacement. I mean, so you can go A and B goes to B and A, or B and A goes to A and B. I mean, it doesn't matter. You can go both ways. Some of these things are a little bit more complex than that one. This is not the case here. You can't start out with not P and derive those other things. This is two. Disjunctive syllogism. So first of all, it has something to do with the disjunction. Syllogism is just the word for a, a form of inference. And it's a, it's a, again, it's a fairly traditional name for this particular allowed move. But it says anytime you have two things, I think actually the Logic Cafe actually begins with this one. You know, very, very long ago, when the first time they started to give you an example of a logical argument, they said something about two people going to law school and someone didn't, or something like that. Then they went off into Bolivia and South America and they were saying, well, we know we're either going to you know, uh, Bolivia or Argentina, and it's not Bolivia, so it must be Argentina. That was disjunctive syllogism. That was that rule. Uh, but here we, we give it a name and uh, we allow it. If you have a disjunction of the form P wedge Q, P or Q, and if you know that either one of those is false, then you conclude that the other one must be. And that should make pretty reasonable common sense. Any questions about that one? All right, last but not least is another one that should make pretty good common sense. Matter of fact, it's whenever I try to you know, say a few words in other classes, like my introduction to philosophy class, when I want to say a few words about you know, logic or reasoning of some sort, this is often the one I use. If you know that if P then Q, and if you know, well, if Q then R, then you may legitimately conclude if P then R. Right? If you know that uh, if uh, Socrates is human and if all humans uh, are rational, as this is a classical syllogism taken from an example from Aristotle, meaning not that they're you know, really good, clever thinkers, but that they have a mind that can reason, uh, then Socrates is rational. Okay, any questions about this one? All right, let's go to some examples. Let's get my glasses, and then go to some examples. All right. There it is. Okay, let me work through this one with you. Uh, let's just see where we can go. Now, any suggestions about a first step in line five? Because part of, part of what I want to do is to, once, I, just as, as last time, I want to show you how you write this down in the Logic Cafe. <laughs> That's, let's just see if we can do something. Okay. What would you do first? <coughs> That's a good question, but I deliberately left that off of this. Um, can you get L from an or elimination? Well, you've got L, horseshoe, J, wedge, W. What else would you need then to get? Uh, you need M, horseshoe, J, wedge, W, right? If you were going to do an or elimination, you'd have to show that, I mean, given what you've got, you only got one. You need this. You need that. L implies something, M implies that same thing, so therefore that same thing is true. So that's what you'd need for that. And I, you know, I'm not quite sure how you're going to get M. You could, you could say L implies T, and since T isn't true, uh, L can't be true, so then M must be All right, let's do that by stages. Uh, what's the first step, Sam, and then others see the rest of it, I think, too. <laughs> All right, so, so you got, so you, you, were, you were using lines two and three. For the first step, right? Uh, 
uh, using perhaps this rule. Okay, so you say HS. And then your conclusion is L horseshoe T, right? And then, then what did you do? Because T isn't true, then what? Okay. All right, because of what? You're taking lines one and five, and you're using now this, this rule, modus tollens. So you're saying not L. And then lastly, well, fine, but what are we doing? Don't save me any time because the, 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 the process has to be, you know, I want to, what, what we want to go over is exactly what you write down and. and and you get M. So the answer is we're trying to derive M, and that's, you know, there are probably other things you could derive, but this was the one that sort of I would think would leap off the page. But part of what you need to do in general derivations is sort of you will often need to have a direction to go in, but I wanted to see how, how well we could proceed just by looking at the premises and seeing what we thought might be derived. All right. I think there may be one more like that. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, on this one, why don't you fill it in yourself? If you want me to go up or down to one of these other, you know, uh, frames, or if you want to jot them down, there's only three of them, uh, I will. But why don't you go ahead and uh, let me know when you're ready. David, what am I going to put for the rule uh, for going to line five using one and two? HS and the result. Okay, then uh, using three and five. And then how am I going to get S out of that? And that's it. Any questions about that one? Okay, this is pretty simple. Try your hand at this one. We'll get to somewhat more complex ones in a moment. That's good. Any questions about that one? Okay, here's another one. <laughs> okay, uh, Alex Sojda, why don't we? See what you have. What, what do you think? Okay. And then I use four and ampersand elimination to get L. And three and five and U elimination to get L. Okay. Will, Rush, see it? Will? Well, you know that I mean, all of these, every time you have a line in the derivation, you can say, well, I know that L and J. So I've got that from the premises. So that means I know L and I know J. So I can just assert one of them, L. So that's, what, that's where we get 4 ampersand elimination for L. Is that what your question was? Yeah, okay. Okay. 
Yeah, and it's, it's one that we've been working with before, so yeah. it's one of our earlier rules. <laughs> indeed, indeed. All right. Um, let me see if there's, there's more. No. Well, I prepared a bunch of panels, but they are not showing up. That's because I must have uploaded the wrong file. Um, I think it was in... I can't remember which tutorial. I think you've already flown by the, one of the, you know, a pair of the worst problems for me in the Logic Cafe. Though I think they were in either tutorial three or four, where you, know, you had to go out here and assume some, you know, some pretty you know, arcane things, and it really was taxing your strategic uh, ability to see what's the target, which is what Sam was referring to earlier. He says, well, what's the target? What am I supposed to be deriving here? That's a very good question to ask you know, at, at, at first glance whenever you're being challenged to do something, because what the target is will determine in large part what you might use in the way of a subderivation, or uh, the best strategy for deriving. But especially when it comes to subderivations, always ask yourself, how, do you, how would you get a conclusion that looks like that, that's of the form, for example, curl p, or if it just asserts something, blah, how would you get that? Well, sometimes the best thing to do in either of those cases is to assume the opposite of what you're trying to prove, and then see what follows from that, coupled with whatever premises you've got. So keep that in mind as you're working through these subderivations, and I think you're probably pretty comfortable with, uh, with the horseshoe introduction, which says that, well, if you're, what you're looking for is, a, uh, is, is an implication, if you're looking for the horseshoe, then the best way to get that is by, first of all, assuming the antecedent and seeing where that takes you with the premises that you've been given. And if you've got something that's still complex, that you, don't, you, don't, you can't figure out, well, how am I supposed to prove that? Then you might need a second subderivation. Are there any questions at all? Yes, sir. You did go over that one where you said whether the, uh, the anything can imply something that's true. Yeah, you know, I think that's one of the ones that got lost. <laughs> but you, it is among the exercises that you'll see. And I, you know, without without having a problem to sort of pop up here, uh, what was all right? What was the example again? Remind me. Maybe I can think of some sort of example that we could use. Example. Yeah. Well, I mean, what was the thing that I was supposed to be? I think, I think the thing went like this. Uh, let me give myself a, a blank sheet. I think, what we're, I think the problem that I had in mind and that I really was wanted to bring out for you, you're supposed to prove this and prove, prove that this is logically true, in fact. So let me go give myself a couple of columns, a bunch of rows. This is a... Maybe that's enough, maybe it's not. But this is, you're supposed to prove that, that this is logically true. A and B implies not J implies B. Okay? So I think that, that was the... So, let's, so we'll start with the first line. Assume what? Somebody else. Let's assume A and B. Oh, I think I need another line. I need the thing out here. Um, okay, then what? I mean, cause, you know, but the point is, I'm sort of looking for, and this is the way the Logic Cafe, stop it, encourage you, uh, you to think about this. Well, that's because what I want down here is not J horseshoe B. Right? Well, how would I get that? S somebody else. Alex, minor, you see it? What would I want? I want this line down here. Which how do I get that? All right, let's go back a step. I wanted this line down here, right? How do I get? The, how would I get that? Well, I'm going to assume A and B. Why? Because A and B is the antecedent of a conditional, and the line I want to get to is a conditional. All right, so now I get this line that I want to get to, right? I want to prove that this, this. I, huh, you can't see what I'm doing. I want to prove, I'm pointing at this thing over here, and of course you can't see that. Yeah, so do, 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 this, this, that, <laughs> it's wacko. All right, look, over here now, <laughs> where I'm actually pointing at something that can be seen by other human beings in the world, uh, 
This is what we wanted to prove. And the, the strategy for proving a material conditional, a horseshoe, is to assume the antecedent. I didn't write the, the words justification and derivation and stuff up there. But you, you want to assume the antecedent so that you can show that the, the consequent follows from that, right? And then you can just go over here by an application of horseshoe introduction to say that, well, this implies that, right? So now here we have another horseshoe. So what are we going to do? Yeah. So over here we say, well, what if not J? Oh, well then, now how we proceed, this is another assume, how we sh proceed should be pretty claim. What we want to do is to get not J horseshoe B. So what do I do? Huh? Yeah. What do I bring down? Mm. Now what do I have? Then I have from, this is, let me give you some numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, what I have from there is this. I have from lines two to three by, right? And then from lines one through seven, using the same rule, I have that. So what that proves is that, I mean, not J comes out of the blue, right? I mean, what you, this was the example I was thinking of. Um, not J comes out of the blue because, and why would, just because A and B are true, why would not J imply B? Because that's what we've demonstrated here. Well, it's because if B is true, we don't even use A, but if B is true, anything implies it. I could have assumed anything on that, on line two, anything in the world, correct? And I would have gotten that that thing that I assumed, no? Okay. <laughs> Let's say not J stands for, it's not the case that Jack is standing in front of you. Okay, that's what not J means. So just write it in there. If B is true, it, we've just demonstrated that it implies it. Now what's the sense of that, maybe you're wondering? How can it possibly be that anything implies the truth? Well, it's because it's true. <laughs> it can't be, and, and we know all about material implication. If it's true, it doesn't matter what's in the antecedent. How are we able to assume A and B? Oh, just because if it were true, I mean, what we're doing is when we assume these lines, we're just saying if. That's why, that's why, right, that's why, uh, what if dot, 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 that's why he keeps putting that in. He says, well, what if that were true? If we say, or what if A and B were true? And then you go through this little rigmarole and you come down to the conclusion, well, if A and B were true, then not J would imply B. Matter of fact, anything would. If A and B were true, if, and you forget about A. If B, all we have to do is put A in that, or B in that line. We don't need A. I mean, A doesn't appear in the proof. But it, we, we, we are demonstrating uh, that if you know that something is true, and that's the antecedent, if, right, here's an if and here's an if. If you know that something is true, anything implies it. And that's just basically what this comes down to. If you know that something is true, it's implied by everything. It doesn't appeal to your intuitions, I think. No, it does. And, th and that, again, is one of the possibly problematic. I, didn't, I don't want to, to, to undermine your sense that, wow, that doesn't seem like common sense logic to me. It's one of the ways of, of making logic work into a formal system is having to make choices, like the choice that we have to make for how are we going to understand the word or. Well, we're going to, logically, in our logic, we're understanding that to mean the inclusive or, not the exclusive or. The exclusive or you can formulate in logic, but the, 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 the symbols that we use, and we want to keep them down to a roar, the symbols that we use, we want to sort of, uh, uh, we're going to use the inclusive or more than we're going to use the other one. And there are other systematic reasons for doing this. Every single, I mean, every other interpretation of if-then that you can think of has 
some sort of an interpretation in, uh, in formal logic. But what we're going to we're going to say that our basic one is material implication, which is false only in one case. It's false only if the premises are true, or the, I'm sorry, the antecedent is true and the conclusion false. That's the interpretation we're going to use. And one of the perhaps odd artifacts of that is exactly this: that you know, if something's true, anything implies it using material implication. And the only justification I can give you uh, for that is that sometimes it's, it's a way we, I mean, if you're thinking about if then, you're saying, well, let's say we just really did know that B was true, like uh, uh, a, a tautology, let's say a logical truth, like A is A. The novelist Ayn Rand makes much of this one, if you've ever heard of her. But A is A. She thinks you could derive an awful lot of interesting stuff from that. I'm not sure that the, <laughs> there's much interesting stuff that can be derived from A is A, unless you make some less certain interpret you know, interpretations of what A is on each side of that equation. But anyway, she makes a lot of this, because A is A, or A equals A, is a tautology. It has to be true. It's a logical truth in the, in the, in the language that we've been using. Well, if you know something like that, now this is, this is the uh, no, underline no, it's got to be true, it can't be false. If you know something like that, then you'll say, if you know, you remember, you really know this, and someone says, well, what if, um, oh gee, what if Obama hadn't been elected? Well, A still would be A. <laughs> you know, what if, uh, oh, I don't know, let's say something bizarre happened. Let's say uh, there weren't any earth or moon. A still would be A. It's a logical truth. What if A didn't equal A? Well, that's one of the curiosities here. A still would equal A, if we know that A equals A. I mean, that's the crucial thing. If we have that, if we were able to say, uh, we know that to be absolutely certainly the case, if you know that, anything implies it. It seems like one of the main problems we get into is that in English, yeah. if then implies causation, whereas in logic there's no implication of causation. Exactly. I think that is a, a constant problem here, is people are trying to look for the causal link. They're thinking about this thing in a more empirical vein. They're saying, well, what is it that, no what would you normally think would lead as a consequence, not as a consequence, but as a, as, a, as a natural consequence, if such and such were the case? And so you start thinking naturalistically here. But we're not working with physics, and we're not working with chemistry, and we're not working with any empirical science. We're working with logic. And so you have to remember these, these big, serious conditions on that. If we know, if we knew B were, was true, if P, B was true, then nothing in the world could make it false. And if that's true, uh, then the implication, this, then, that, is true, because of the way we're interpreting implication. We're saying it's true, the right side is true, the consequence is true, so it can't be, the implication can't be false. Your best bet. I mean, every now and then you might make some common sense out of this, if you sort of think about this the right way. But your best bet is think of, think of this as definitional. It's the definition of horseshoe that it's false only in case the left side is true and the right side is false. So if we know that the right side is true, it's going to be true right down the line, that horseshoe. I uh, want to remind you what I said, I mean, what, you can, and what the difference is between a rule of inference and a rule of replacement. Uh, first of all, a rule of inference, um, can, uh, let's, let's think about mo modus tollens, which shows P horseshoe Q not Q, therefore not P. That's the rule, one of the rules we learned the other day, right? Uh, that rule operates only on full lines. You cannot use a rule of inference on half of a line or something that's within present, uh, thank you very much, something that's within the uh, parentheses on some line of your proof. You can only use a rule of inference on an entire line. So that's one thing that will make a difference between uh, rules of inference and rules of replacement. And the other thing is, and I mentioned this before, I think I was using uh, horseshoe elimination the other day in my example, but similarly here, you, you could go this way, all right. You're allowed to infer that, but if you were given that, you can't go backwards. Whereas with rules of replacement, you can go either way. You can flip-flop. 
And so these things are a good deal more powerful in a lot of ways than rules of replacement. They, they, and they streamline your work enormously. The things that have annoyed you already in a logic cafe where you've had to you go through you know, agony trying to, you know, to, to derive something that's perfectly obvious, like A and B from B and A, uh, you don't have to do that anymore. You'll have to do that for a little while this week, but when you get to tutorial seven and eight, you'll begin to be permitted to use these new rules of replacement. So I'm, not, I'm giving you a preview of what you get to. You can't do these right away, because the Logic Cafe will insist that you continue to learn the first, uh, the rules of inference in the old way. But once you get to tutorial seven and eight, you begin to be allowed to use the rules of replacement. All right, so let's look at some of these and then try out some problems. Um, Uh, I would like you to go to work on this, see what you can do using the rules that are before you, uh, and, then, and then we'll come back to it in a second after I've had a chance to introduce them. Just see what you can do and how easily it comes, and then let me... Mark, uh, tell me what I should do in line number one. Um, using the new rules. Using the new rules. Um, in line one, I changed it to um, from the premise. So line one. Yep. Uh, by association. Yep. We have not A and B and C. Mm-hmm. Did you stop there? No. Okay, what'd you do next? Uh, in line two, uh, from line, actually, from line three. In line three, from line two, mm -hmm. by CM, okay. I have B and not A and C. Okay. Simple one, all right? Any questions about this? Look over the, you know, look at the rules, the, the association rule and the commutation rule, if you have any questions about that. but. That's the notice that we can use those within parts of uh, any line. You don't have to limit yourself to the main connected. All right. So let's uh, this is the commutation rule, which we use. You can use it in any of with any of three of our connected. As I think is you know is something you'd see, but I just want to make that explicit. You could use this with ampersand, with wedge, or with triple bar. If you've got this, you can go to that. If you've got that, you can go to this. Now, a rule we didn't use yet is is obvious. All of these things, you know, not all of them, but many of them are just as obvious as can be. This is just double negative. A du double negative is a positive. So if you have the negation of not p, then that means p. And you can go either way, any place you see it in a derivation. But be cautious. You have to make it explicit. If you're moving from one thing to another, whether it's in a derivation or a subderivation, uh, you have to make explicit what you're doing. It's just, it's, it's just as stupid as a computer, in a way. I mean, you've just got to tell it what you're doing. But then if you do, if you tell it what you're doing, it'll get results for you. You just make it absolutely clear. If it knows the rules, and you have to. That's why it's kind of elegant. I, it's not very often that you see a, a program like John Halpin's. I mean, that's something I, I look all over for, trying to find it. And it's not a new program, unfortunately. So it has to be upgraded and updated in many ways. But the interactive character of it is just fantastic, because it gets you doing the stuff faster than any logic text I've ever seen. And it gets you doing it in a way that's, you know, that, that really understands that logic is a skill. It's not a knowledge base. You're not just sort of saying, oh boy, A, or ha, I didn't know that, B and curl A and C, yo. <laughs> we don't care about these lines. We don't care about these letters. What we care about is the skills getting there and the procedures. But the, the, the logic cafe, when you work with it, actually 
promotes these skills in an elegant way. But you've got it, you know, it's, it's, it's a computer, it's li like a computer program. And so that's why it's, you know, the, the, the mixing of uh, symbolic logic and computation is, uh, is, is, is an extraordinarily fruitful mix. But you have to remember, you're talking to a computer basically, even if you're doing this in pencil and paper. And I want to say something else too. The results of your uh, work so far confirms something that I think I said earlier in the quarter, maybe in the first week, but that I want to repeat again. Sometimes trying to bring the skills from working at the computer out onto paper, like when you folks here in the class are doing a quiz, sometimes you know you can do it fine on the computer, but it just is a little different when you're trying to bring it into a manual skill of writing things down. It's a very odd thing about the human being, but it, you know, you get used to doing things in a certain way, and you just can't do the same thing in another way. So it's, it will be, it's useful from here on out especially, it will be useful for you not only to be doing these things uh, online, but especially when you get to a dodgy problem and you can't figure it out, pull out a pad of paper and, and use pencil and paper. It'll cause you to bring a different part of your body and mind. Of, you know, people talk about right brain, left brain stuff, but that's part of what goes on here. It sort of brings more resources into the solution of the problem. And I am absolutely convinced that mentality and cognition is not just something that's seated in the central nervous system even. It's not, certainly not just in the brain, but it's not just in the central nervous system. It has to do with all kinds of preparations and readinesses. And these implicate hormones and all kinds of other stuff in you. So, I mean, there's a lot, and then as a matter of fact, I also happen to have the wacky view, but it's, it's my view, that cognition itself, see Andy Clark about this. There's an author named Andy Clark you ought to really read. There's a, uh, there's a book he wrote that just captures things that I've been saying for years in a very, very elegant way. And he's, he, the, the book just came out a couple of years ago. It's called Natural Born Cyborg. And the thesis of this book, if, is anybody familiar with Andy Clark's at all or with Natural Born Cyborg? If you're interested in these things about cognition, if you're interested in that, read Andy Clark. He argues that uh, the, the mind should not be understood as sort of being localized just in the brain. And indeed, it, in, 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 uh, it involves the environment. And I'm not going to go into this at great length because I'm supposed to be talking about logic. But, <laughs> but one of the things that he offers as an example, and you should think about this, is, that, is something that comes out of a, a remark that, uh, that uh, Oh, Feynman. What's, what's uh, the physicist Feynman's first name? Don't know. OK, Richard, Richard, Richard Feynman. Uh, a, a remark that he once made when he was being interviewed. Uh, uh, he was saying, well, you know, he's working out a problem in pencil and paper, or working out a problem on a chalkboard. And the interviewer, and he was trying to illustrate something. The inter interviewer said, OK, so, so how, how do you figure these things out? He says, well, you know, I just I compute them. He says, well, you, I don't understand how you compute these things in your head. He says, I'm not computing them in my head. I'm using the pencil and paper. I'm using the chalkboard. And what Clark observes, and this may or may not have been what Feynman meant, is it's not just that this is a tool that assists your mind. The computation itself is something that involves writing it down on the piece of paper, writing it down on the chalkboard, or whatever you're doing. That, that you're, you're, it's a back and forth thing between what your, what your brain is doing and what your hand is doing on the chalkboard. And if it weren't for the pencil and paper, you wouldn't be able to do the problem. And it's not just like you're storing data there and moving back, because the computation is going on in the pencil and paper. You're not storing things there, and, then, and you're using mechanical rules a lot that you wouldn't be able to use unless you get to this line, and you say, oh, well, then I can go there, and then I can go there. And the computation and cognition and intelligence itself invokes stuff that's not just in the central nervous system, not just in the brain, not just in the body. It's, it's a way that we have of engaging in the world. We are cyborgs already. We do not confront a world that's indifferent to us. We have tools out there, and by a cyborg, he means we are part artificial, part the product of our own products, whether they are computers or hammers or screwdrivers or pencils and paper. We've invented these things to sort of extend consciousness out into the world. Extend our abilities to think out in the world. So that's why a part of the thing that it's part of my own attitude. Also, I mean, I wrote an article in 1955 saying that memory is not a not a matter of storing things in the brain. I think I repeated this to you at one point somewhere along. And maybe it was in another message to another class. I don't know. But at some point, uh, I, I, I set out this cryptic note saying 
memory is simply not a matter of storing things in the brain. It's not. Uh, what you do is, you know, your, your whole interaction with the environment is, it becomes different as you learn. And so the things that you're confronting, the more, you, the more and more you engage with the environment, become different things in a way. You become attuned to them differently. Now, if you're interested in that stuff, there's a psychologist named J.J. Gibson who's written an awful lot about how uh, perception works that way. Uh, if you're interested in more sophisticated things, Niels Bohr is a great uh, uh, um, uh, supporter of this kind of view, even in talking about subatomic phenomena. He says, look, there could be no such thing as an object, a, a sharp line drawn between the subject and the object uh, at the quantum level. Because every time you go down there to look at the supposed object, there's only, looking itself involves interacting with it. I mean, what is looking? Looking is maybe shining a light on it. Well, at that level, you're shining photons and they knock the damn thing away. I mean, you can't, you can't look without interacting. You can't observe without interacting. Now, that's true even at the macroscopic level, but it doesn't matter so much up here. It matters a lot at the subatomic level. So, there's, so his thesis was there's no objective line to be drawn between the observer and the observed. All there are are interactions. So all, I say all of that, you know, be sensitive uh, in this uh, logic class, but see, be sensitive elsewhere to the modes of interaction uh, that you, with which you encounter stuff, especially in, in, in the matter of learning. I mean, sometimes it helps. I mean, I, I, another thing I've done, you know, just in reading stuff, I mean, I've learned, I highlight a million things. I write things in the margins. I, I never go back and look at this stuff. That's not the point. The point is just to engage my right hand while I'm mentally, I mean, I, I, can, I, I find I can concentrate on what I'm reading faster if I do something like highlight. It just engages me more. It's a kind of a remote uh, alien thing. You just come to a, 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 a difficult text and you start trying to read it. And it just, you know, you go back over the same paragraph over and over and over again. You can't get it. You start writing, you start to the, go to the top line and say, I don't get this. And write down, I don't get this. You say, what could this possibly mean? And then you start writing stuff, and pretty soon you become more engaged with it. I don't guarantee it'll work all the time, but it's a very useful technique to use. But here in logic, my suggestion is, don't just use the logic cafe. Don't just use the, the keyboard in working with it, and the mouse, or the mouse replacement device. Uh, also, from time to time, use good old fashioned pad and pencil. I think you'll find that it helps you understand the stuff a little bit better, and it'll certainly prefer, prepare you for situations like uh, quizzes in, in class here anyway, uh, where you know you, that's what you're required to do. You're supposed to do something with pencil and paper. Has anybody encountered the, you know the, the, this this phenomenon? Maybe not. I'll, I'm just I'm interested. This phenomenon where you feel real comfortable with the stuff from the Logic Cafe, but when you come in here and take it on a quiz, it just doesn't work the same. Has anybody encountered that at all? No. So all of this has been absolutely in vain. <laughs> OK. So double negation. We'll get out of these in pretty quick order. Implication. This one is not so obvious. If you did the truth table, uh, you'd be able to see it. And I think one of the things you're going to be asked to do in the first half of the week is to demonstrate that this is true, just to satisfy yourself that you can prove it. But after. The middle of the week, or after the, the, the middle of these tutorials, once you get to tutorial seven and eight, and then forever after, you are allowed to simply replace P horseshoe Q with not P wedge Q, because they are logically equivalent. And if you think about how the truth, this, the truth table of this works, and sort of try and, you can just do it, it's a pretty simple truth table, you'll just see that the truth tables are identical. But this is a very, 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 very useful uh, rule of replacement, I am. Okay. And this is another useful rule that I think lots of you see. I mean, lots of you have, you know, intuited that it's right. And, and other people who have uh, studied circuit logic or done uh, other, you know, other, other math courses uh, where this, uh, this comes up, they know that this is correct. But anytime you see P horseshoe Q, you know if not Q, then not P. Why? Well, because if Q is false, that is, if not Q is true, 
Well, then P can't be true, or else this is false. So if this is true, if P horseshoe Q is true, then not Q also implies not P. Because what you can't get, if this is true, is a line where Q is false and P is true. Any questions about that one? All right. This is a weird word, and it's a weird rule, but you will find that it is sometimes useful. And it'll be more often that it'll come up you want to go in the reverse. That's going to come up more often as a useful technique. But if you ever happen to see a molecular sentence that comes out P and P or P or P, you can just say, well, just let's reduce that to P because it's just it's redundant. But it'll be more useful in a proof or in derivations going the other way. You can replace P with P ampersand P or P with P wedge P. Any questions about that? This one is also not obvious, but it's something that's well known and, and extraordinarily use, useful. It's the only one I think of the rules that is actually named after someone. The, the, the logician De Morgan, I don't know what his first name was. And the rule is that anytime you see a sentence like that, you can go to that. And if you think about it, the logic is true. This says not both P and Q when that just means, well, either not P or not Q. And this says, not either of P or Q, and that just simply means, well, both not P and not Q. But you can use that rule to uh, avoid lots and lots of uh, otherwise necessary computation. And this is another rule we used in that first problem, uh, association. You're just entitled to package sentences differently. If you got P ampersand Q ampersand R, then you can do that, and the same with a wedge. So with those two, you can use the rule of association. This is also useful. Uh, often, again, more often when going from right to left rather than left from to right, but what it allows you to do is to take, if you say P and either Q or R, well, that just means P and Q or P and R. And if you have a similar situation with, uh, with or, with disjunction, you can do the same thing. This one is the one that you asked about, Kevin. It's called equivalence. And it just says that if you have Either way, if you have this, you can break it down into either P and, you know, think about the truth table again for equivalence. The, fir the, first and fourth, uh, uh, the first and last lines are the ones that are true, or all the other ones are false. It's when they're both true or both false. That's when equivalent works. So it's, P, it's either P and Q, if this, is, if this is true, if P is equivalent to Q, then either P and Q or not P and Q, or not P and not Q, sorry. Similarly, this is one you know. Uh, this is also the same rule. You can replace P equivalent Q, P triple bar Q with either, with, with that, with that conjunction. But that's a step. You have to use that. You have to use that uh, and actually uh, use, uh, cite the rule. Last one is exportation, which is also a useful rule. And it's not as obvious as some of the other ones. If you have P horseshoe, <laughs> Q horseshoe R, that's the same as and may be replaced with P and Q. If you have both of these things, then R. Because if you have P and then you get Q, you get R. And that's just another way of saying the thing on the right and vice versa. All right, now let's. Uh, Uh, go back to the, not that one, but let's go back to, to this particular problem. Uh, I don't think that there's any questions that you, any further, I mean, you didn't have any questions then, but I, I you know, just want to make sure that there's no further questions about 
not not just the use of the rule, but how you write them down, how you write down the justifications in that column. All right, let's do a, another thing using some of these rules. Uh, go ahead and work on that one. Let's talk a little bit about strategy in doing these sorts of things. Um, we're supposed to derive L horseshoe S. Now we've got all these new rules that we've gone over. Do any of them, any of the rules suggest to you a particular strategy starting from the, you know, the, the, the goal back? We're supposed to try to get to L or S. Is there anything in these premises that indicate, you know, a possible strategy? Nathan? Um, if you can get to the point of using I am on not L or S, that would give you L horseshoe S. Okay, yeah, in other words, you're looking for L horseshoe S, and the rule implication, I am, allows you to change not L wedge S to L horseshoe S. So that would be a good thing to try to get to. I'm just sort of saying what you said in the reverse order. Uh, so let's just use that now. I mean, that's one way of doing this, is saying let's, let's get that into the right form. So it's, it's line two, we're gonna use the rule I am and then we're going to repeat everything else, because we can only do one thing at a time. Is that what you had in mind, Nathan? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, is there anything else? Now that you've gotten that, you know, all right, well, we're ho our hope is, we hope to be able to use line three in order to get further. And uh, we've got, again, a whole list of replacement rules. Is there anything that suggests to you another replacement that we might be interested in making. Somebody other than Nathan. Adam. Uh, De Morgan on line one. Okay. Use one, De Morgan. And what would that leave us with? Not A and B. Because not A and B comes down to not A or not B. And that's De Morgan's rule is the rule we'd like. And then finally, yet another person. What are we left being able to do? Greg. You can do a disjunctive syllogism. Um, yeah, on lines four and three. Yeah. Gives us what we want. Any questions about that procedure? So, uh, in the Logic Cafe, the, uh, the, um, the suggestion, well, actually he does this in most cases, almost all cases, from time to time he will, as time goes by, leave you to do this yourself. But almost always he'll put the thing you're to derive, rather than putting it up there, he'll throw it down below somewhere. And then he'll put all kinds of question marks around it, you know, to indicate that you haven't derived it yet, but that's what you're trying to derive. That might be a useful thing for you to do too. You know, to put that down there, remember, remind yourself that that's the goal, but not necessary at all. All right. Try this one now. I don't guarantee because I think I w just wound up deciding to make three columned tables all the west rest of the way through these these exercises this morning. So there's no, I don't necessarily mean to uh, guarantee that you need to do a subderivation or need to use that third column. You may or you may not. But let's uh, get a little bit fancier and uh, see what, see how we might do this. Okay, Kevin, what's your strategy here? I, I, a little louder, please. Uh, so that the first one I could do the transition, so then I eventually just want to say that my final answer is transition. So, like so what, what the result so of using transposition on one is? I get T implies S. Right. And then um, on line three with the double negation. Yeah, now that's the extra <coughs> line I indicated that uh, would uh, 
depress some of you if you have to do this, but you do, because the way the only way that we're allowed to use disjunctive syllogism is, is when we have explicitly the negation of one of the disjuncts. And so that, that's what does that here, is we have to move from line three, T horseshoe S, which anybody can see is the negation of the left disjunct in line two, but we have to make that explicit. We have to make it clear exactly how we're doing this. So uh, what we're doing here on line four is getting to that step, and then line five is just the application of disjunctive syllogism from four to two, which gets, gets us with what we're looking for. Yes, sir, Sam. I think it's a different way. Okay, all right, let me, uh, hang on just one second. All right, Li what's line three then? Um, yeah, go to, go to yours. <laughs> uh, I did T implies S the same, with the same thing you did. And okay, so for one by transposition, you got T implies S. And then I did implication on line two to get T implies S implies L. You did what? Implication. So you get T implies S implies From on line two, okay. I am, and you get T implies S implies L. Mm -hmm. I see. And then by yeah. horseshoe elimination, you get L. What's wrong with that? Nothing, that's good. And what you'll find is that there's uh, often many, well, there probably are definitely many ways of doing these things. Some that would take hundreds and hundreds of lines of proof, but you don't want to, you don't want to use those. But this is just as short as I recall as the other one, and, and it, it works just as well. Does everybody see that? Okay. Another one, this time derive L ampersand curl S. Greg, Yes. what's a good first step? I'm not sure if I did this in a way, but I used uh, implication. A little louder, please. Implication on line one to. OK. Uh, I got L oh, I'm sorry. And what? Not S or T, right? Yeah. Okay, then what? Then I used the Morgans on line two and got not L or not T. Okay. More. Okay. Then I used an ampersand elimination on one to get L. And you could have done that on three, two, but okay, one. Yeah. Elimination. L. And then right. I did it on three to get not S or T. Yeah, well, you need another step, unfortunately. And that would be five, double negation, curl, curl, L. Curl. In order did to. Did you use an ampersand? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no. Yeah. To, well, I, I'm sorry. You were, I, I misunderstood what you're saying. I, you're on what line? I. Um, on line six, I have written ampersand elimination line three. Oh, okay. Not S or T. I'm sorry. I was jumping to the wrong conclusion. And then I used a disjunctive syllogism on four and five to get not T. That's where you need the double negation. Okay, so five. You have to. You have. You can't just use L on not L with disjunctive syllogism. You have to have the negation, the negate of uh, one of the uh, disjuncts. So you have to do that first, but then you can go seven, four, disjunctive syllogism, and then get curl T. That's what you meant, right? Yes. Okay, then what? And then, now my line numbers are screwed up, but I use curl T and a disjunctive syllogism to get not S from, I guess it's line six. Yep. And then an ampersand introduction. Then I need another line for this yeah. way of doing it. Uh, okay, yeah, but anyway, from ten with um, five and nine, right? Yes. 
in 10, uh, you get what was to be proven? Ellen Curl S. Adam. Um, do you not have to use um, commutation on 6 to flip it around to do disjunctive syllogism? Or no. Or you can do it either way? Uh, yes, that rule was introduced that way. And you can, you can deny either one of the two disjuncts to get the other. Okay. Good. Okay. Makes it easier. Um, <coughs> okay, that's, uh, that's good. Let's try it. What's line three? I did uh, implication on line one. And, then and that, that gives us L ampersand curl S wedge T, right? right? Yep, and then I did distribution on line three. Okay, three, is that, what is that called, DS? Uh, DI. DI, okay. Three DI, and that means we get L and not S or L and T. And then I use the uh, disjunctive uh, syllogism for line four and two. Four and two. And that gives you L and not S. Woof! <laughs> but there's other ways of doing it, aren't there? Does anybody have another way of doing it? Okay, hold on, Josh. Let me do another page. But that's that's very elegant. Very, very elegant indeed. That's pretty similar to the first one, except they use one step less. Okay. Did everyone see how that worked? Before we go, I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to gaze at that and its elegance. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a beautiful, you know, the, sim the simpler and quicker you can do these things, the better, as long as you're obeying the rules. And as far as I see, this is exactly right. This is, this is an excellent, uh, excellent derivation. All right, back to where we were. All right, Josh, line three. Uh, ampersand elimination from line one to get L. Yep. And then I used De Morgan's on line two to get not L, the wedge not T. Okay. Um, and then ampersand elimination on one to get uh, S or Q T. Mm hmm. And then I used a double negative on three to get not not L. Mm -hmm. um, I use the disjunctive syllogism for lines four and six to get not T. And lastly? Um, no, not two, there's two more steps, right? Yeah, I used a uh, modus tollens. Modus for five and seven to get not S, and an ampersand introduction for eight and three. So different techniques work. Strive for elegance. Try that one. There's, there's only, what, two, two more of these, and then actually maybe one more, <laughs> this one. Uh, but there's, there's a, a bunch of techniques that, you know, the, the normal things of proving things are logically false, logically true, logically inconsistent, and that they're logically equivalent. You'll, you'll be encountering problems like that. Here's at least one of these. Maybe we'll have time for a second one. But uh, uh, Alex Miner. Well, I started with uh, and elimination to get not L or S and not L implies S. You can't do that. I figured. That's why I didn't want to say anything because I did it somewhat differently. Well, wait a minute. You, you, but no, you didn't. I got a contradiction in the end. Uh, well, wait a minute. You, what, what, did you, what did you, what did you, what did you, tell me what you got on line two again. I did uh, and elimination to get not L implies S. All right, that's fine. I, I didn't understand. I thought you said the whole thing. And then I said, well, wait, <laughs> just reiteration. But no. So you got that. That's fine. Go ahead. And I did uh, and elimination on line three to get. On line, uh, wait, on, oh, wait, one, well, once on again. Line one, on line three, though. Yeah, and then you got uh, the other one. Not L or S. Yeah. And I did uh, implication on line two to get L or S. <laughs> there you go. 
Oh, well, you gotta go. First of all, you have to do this, I'm afraid. You need double negative, I figure. Yeah. So it's dm. And then, uh, from four, wait a minute, what am I? No, no, I'm sorry. This, then, then this would be, then you can go from four by implication to not L or S. Wait, what am I doing? It's an implication. Let's go back here. I'm, I'm screwing up. This has got to be the last problem. I'm done here <laughs> pretty clearly. All right, so let, let's try it again, uh, Alex. Using, making sure you take double. What what did you say we had? On line four, what did you have? I had the implication on line two, but you need to do a. Uh, you can do that. You can go two I M, but then you get not not L wedge S, right? Okay. Then. Then, then what? Did you do that? Then did you take that step, or just went directly to yeah, L? Or a double negative. Yeah, you need. Then by four, you do a double negation. You get L or S, and that's all you have to do. You stop right there, because you now have. I don't know what you did, but now you have line three and line five directly contradicting each other, and that's all you need to do. They don't have to be next to each other. Doesn't matter what the order is. All you have to do is you prove each of two contradictory statements from the premise or premises, and you've shown that, in this case, it's one line, you've shown that it's logically false because it, it leads to a contradiction. But that's why I stopped you there. I think I have nowhere else to do. No, there's nowhere else to go. Any questions about this one? Do you see how it's done? Uh, the first two steps are obvious. You just simply unpack the, 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 the conjunction. Uh, you do need to take this step in order to make use of implication. Uh, yeah, in order to make use of, of, of what you're doing, you have to first of all, you can do that immediately, but then you have to take the next step and do the double negation to get this. And then once you've got that, that's just simply the, the negation of that. Lizzie? Um, I did it in a very similar way, but I just, instead of breaking it apart, I just used implication on the not L. Okay, let me try it again. I mean, I, I'd like to see it. So, let's see. So, line two would go what? Uh, it was uh, implication on line one. So it's not L wedge S, and it's double negative S. Uh, double negative S. 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 Double 2, ampersand elimination, curl, L or S, and 2, ampersand elimination, you get curl, curl, L or S, and then then 4, D, N, L or S, and then you get the same thing. Okay, do you have to split it up? Because it seems like in just the, the statement, you either have, if L by S is within you, you have to have. You have to prove each one of the lines, and unfortunately, we have to unpack it, yes. So you're, I think your question is, if I just show on one line that we have two contradicting things on that line, is that enough? Is that your question? Uh, yeah, but also, could I use implication without splitting it apart? Because I only used implication on one of the two. You can, you can, yeah, you can use implication on any, you know, any part of a formula, right? You don't have to split it up first. Uh, I am. It's I am. And that's what you did. That is legitimate. Okay. And then, uh, but you do have, line two isn't sufficient to show that you got a contradiction. Uh, and line, and, and, the, and the fact that you got curl bracket something and curl, curl, L, wedge, S, that's also suspicious. If you have L or S and curl L or S, that's fine. That, that, but, but you can't have that in a single line. You have to then pull it out and show that it leads to one you can prove uh, not L or S, and two you can prove L or S. Therefore, this sentence, this sentence is, a con con is logically false because it leads to a contradiction. Other questions? We're done.
I'll hang around if there's anybody who wants to talk about anything or complain about anything or whatever.